Okay, we're going to start talking now about head and neck ultrasound. A lot of topics here, very dense um, amount of material here. I'm going to go through it relatively quickly because we have a lot to cover. Every, and it ranges from neurosonology or transcranial Doppler looking in the brain at the vasculature. We look at the carotids. We're going to look at the facial bones. Look in the uh, peritonsillar region, so what's going on there, and the trachea and the thyroid. And then finally, we'll end it with ocular ultrasound. A lot of the vasculature in the brain using ultrasound. Now, a lot of people don't know that uh, because they think about the skull being in the way and everything and reflecting the sound. But actually, there's a few little windows where you can peek into um, the brain. And you can see the anterior um, cerebral artery, you can see the middle cerebral artery, the posterior cerebral artery, you can um, also make out um, the vertebral arteries as well. And um, when there's a block or where there's a, um, a narrowing of the artery or stenosis, we see the uh, flow velocities really jump up um, using the Doppler. You know, we can calculate the velo we can measure the velocities, and we see the mean flow velocity really jump through the ceiling when there's stenosis. So that's kind of what you're looking for, and you can actually also identify where there's been a total um, occlusion. And there's been a lot of work looking at um, in patients who are having a stroke, not only identifying um, which vessel and stuff with ultrasound, but also potentiating the effects of a clot busting drug like TPA. Um, using smaller doses of TPA because it has a lot of side effects. You can use smaller doses. And then when the TPA arrives at the uh, location of the um, clot, you can then activate um, the TPA or potentiate its effects using ultrasound to kind of um, help uh, increase the surface area for the TPA to work on, the surface area of the clot for the TPA to work on. Anyways, a lot of cool stuff going on here. Um, it probably has a lot to do with the future of neurology and neurosynology, but we're just going to talk very briefly um, about, you know, sort of what, what it looks like on ultrasound. So the transtemporal approach, where the skull gets very thin, uh, the temporal bone, the low-frequency transducer, like a 1 megahertz probe, can penetrate right through that window and into the vasculature. And um, this is what brain sort of looks like on ultrasound. Uh, this is all brain parenchyma here. Uh, basically, it looks like, you know, thyroid or liver or something. That, you know, I think probably more like liver than thyroid to me, but that's the idea. We put the little sampling gate right here across this um, vessel right here, the MCA. And then we can see this uh, waveform here um, using um, um, Doppler. And you can also look through the... Uh, ocular area um, in infra uh, orbital approach you can look behind um, the base of the skull a sub occipital approach and you can also actually look um, below the mandible and see all the way up to the siphon of the carotid artery through the underneath the mandible approach as well so it's really four windows um, but probably the easiest And um, keep in mind that in older patients, and actually um, in women, these um, skulls tend to be a little thicker. I know it's kind of funny, but it's kind of true, actually. And um, with ultrasound, it's a little bit harder to see that. And, um, and But you can definitely see the anterior circulation using this transtemporal approach. This is psychoma right here. And um, they're um, basically doing a posterior view, I'm going to the median and the anterior and then the frontal view right here. So those are those four windows that you just saw Alan clearly identify. Now Alan's going to show you um, the important vessel in the brain here, the MCA. I'm going to color mode and here I see the MCA and the ACA and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put Doppler on. Oops, back here. And I'm going to hit top. And what I get is essentially is MCA Doppler. This, it, this is the systolic uh, flow, and this is diastolic right here.
Yeah, so this is just using one of our, our machines um, that we have available to us, um, sort of off the shelf. You have an MCA stenosis, um, it's basically elevated peak systolic velocities. And so we can see here that uh, in this uh, MCA, there's sort of on this, uh, this is not an ultrasound down here, this is a um, CT angiogram. What we see here is a sudden um, you know, dropping off of the contrast material. So there's stenosis right here. Um, over here, it's patent. Over here, it's um, occluded. And so this is the Doppler waveform that corresponds with this um, right MCA. Over here, this left MCA appears normal. This is what normal velocity waveform looks like. You can see here that the velocity, the peak And when that happens, when it goes off the top and comes back up on the bottom, that's called aliasing, that the velocities are so high, it's aliasing coming back along the bottom here. Not a critical term to know about, but uh, that's what you see here when you see the, the, um, the velocities coming right off the top of the screen. Now we're going to talk about the carotid arteries. And, um, and a lot of uh, people think that the carotid arteries are a window to the coronary arteries, um, that... Um, that you can, um, if you see disease there in the carotid artery, that it corresponds to other disease going on in the rest of the vasculature, particularly the coronary arteries. And because the carotids are so easy to get to, they're like right underneath the skin. I mean, they're just sort of jumping out at you as soon as you place the transducer on the skin. Um, so you can use a nice high-frequency transducer uh, to see these uh, beautiful vasculature right up close on the screen there. And the, um, you can see both the intima and the media, um, and uh, they're, they're involved in the atherogenesis and, um, and the lesions that we can see uh, start to um, stenose or occlude the, the carotid artery. And what happens is um, the, um, you have the intimal thickness, the fibromuscular hyperplasia, as you get older, that's a normal thing. Um, but uh, the medial thickness, or you can see smooth muscle hypertrophy, um, that's associated even with simple conditions like hypertension, which a lot of people have, even in the absence of an atherosclerotic plaque. So that's what we're going to be um, really looking at using um, ultrasound. And so how accurate is it? Well, the CIMT stands for the carotid intimal medial thickness. That predicts future coronary heart disease events in this study, and it showed that uh, basically the, um, this is the carotid intimal medial thickness, which I'm about to show you how to measure. If it's less than, you know, um, 0.6 millimeters, then that um, shows a very low risk for having um, an incident. Um, I'm sorry, um, CHD is defined as uh, either a heart attack or cardiac death. And so um, the coronary heart disease incidence is this y-axis here. So it's not surprising when you start to think about it as that carotid intimal medial thickness starts to get larger and larger and larger, the odds of having um, a heart attack or dying from cardiac death go up as we go here. And so I think this is a one way to kind of help show your patients right there at the bedside that you know they really should be taking their antihypertensives and also their um, anti-cholesterol drugs because I think this will um, showing them their intimal medial thickness and a graph like this will help them be um, sort of more compliant, I think, with those types of medications. And, you know, it hasn't really gained a lot of traction because there hasn't been access to ultrasound until very recently. In other words, if you're, let's say, a primary care doctor or a cardiologist, you would have to refer your patient feasible to do that on a large scale. Um, but they did do it in, um, in this study, and they had um, a lot of patients. Um, you know, you can see the end there is, is very, very high. It doesn't correlate early on as well in women, um, but as you get to this larger thickness here, um, it starts to have a better uh, correlation. And the same thing is true for strokes, actually. So when you measure that carotid intimal medial thickness, that your odds of having um, a stroke on this y-axis here go up um, as your thickness gets, as your carotid intimal medial thickness gets larger and larger, the odds of having a stroke actually go up as well. And um
algorithm um, to decide how at what risk your, um, your your patients are. So if your carotid intimal medial thickness here it is less than 50 percentile or greater than 50 percentile, or you actually visualize a carotid plaque, which is an actual um, part of the carotid artery that is um, severely narrowed from a plaque on it, then um, you know and you know, there's other factors going on here, you can decide how risky your patients are here and decide what to do next with them. Now, how do you measure it? Well, um, if, if you look at this, this vessel here, a schematic diagram, um, this is towards the head, this is towards the feet, and the common carotid is along here, and as it goes towards the head, it bifurcates into the internal carotid and over to the external carotid. And we can see that kind of happening here. This is, you know, sort of going along here, and then it suddenly bifurcates into the internal carotid and then sort of down to the external carotid. And uh, it's, it's at this region right before, sort of right before the bifurcation. Um, right at that level of the bifurcation, what's known as the carotid bulb. Um, and because of this uh, tubular shape, this this um, the vessel has here, um, getting a good beam, um, and basically gives you very very nice um, in images of the carotid artery. You can turn that frequency up and get beautiful um, images here at this location. And it, it looks like this when we're measuring it. We try to kind of trace it along for about a one centimeter length along that posterior wall. So this is the anterior wall of the carotid. This is the posterior wall. And as the sound goes through sort of the neck muscles and then it reaches the carotid, this, this, the fluid, the blood in the carotid um, is low attenuating uh, material. And so that's why the posterior wall of the carotid is, is very easy to visualize. And we can see this little separation here. And that's the, um, the intimal medial thickness. So you just measure from sort of this wall down to this wall, and you would drop a caliper right along here. And that distance, hopefully, is um, But if you, you know, took it to a patient who was much older or had, uh, you know, a lot of known coronary um, um, heart disease, you could see this uh, thicken out quite a bit, actually. So something to think about, this carotid artery uh, measurement stuff. Here we are with the transducer in a long longitudinal plane. Now, what we're going to do is move on now and talk about some of the bones. We did a lot of musculoskeletal last week, but we're going to sort of remember some of those techniques and um, bring it to the face. And so... The um, the zygoma is uh, actually articulates with the um, it's with the frontal bone here superiorly, and um, and then with the maxilla um, going immediately, and so um, a zygoma fracture um, will have. broken in two places. You can think about some of the rings in the pelvis that happens as well. But uh, we can see the various uh, bones here on, on ultrasound actually. We can see the frontal bone quite easily. Sure. Um, specifically of the zygomatic arch, um, this is sort of the technique that You just take that gentle curving technique from the tragus of the ear all the way over to that nasolabial fold, and um, and the good thing is you can compare it uh, to the to the other side. And once in a while you'll see that infraorbital nerve foramen sort of uh, drop down, and um, it's pretty easy to to actually to make out. So um, the the infraorbital nerve uh, foramen where that nerve pops out, and uh, that's a common place we do nerve blocks when we're doing sort of. Um, painful things to people's faces in the emergency department. We find that infraorbital nerve uh, frame in and uh, bring a needle down to it and uh, block up that nerve. So uh, just keep in mind uh, that for the zygomatic arch um, and uh, using the looking at the maxilla, you want to start that tragus.
with the indicator towards the patient's scalp. And uh, on the screen, that indicator is on the left side of the monitor. Therefore, the left side of the screen indicates the superior aspect of the zygoma, while the right side of the screen indicates the inferior aspect of the zygoma that corresponds to this lower part of the see the easily the shadowing coming down here in the in the lower field and basically you just sort of slowly scan along um, the area from the tragus tragus to the maxilla along that um, I'm sorry along from the tragus uh, to the nasolabial fold where you're going to see the maxillary process of that zygomatic arch and if you're you know we looking for fractures uh, obviously as we're doing this um, when a patient comes in after they have blunt trauma to the face and it, if there's any discontinuity or depression along that hypercocortex of the zygoma, then you're suspicious uh, for a fracture, although it's easy to identify that little sort of step off over here. Um, but that's just, again, that infraorbital uh, foramen. You can always look on the other side if you have any doubts. Now, about 70% of mandibular fractures um, are, um, are subcondylar. This is important as condylar fractures, especially non-displaced um, fractures are difficult to diagnose with ultrasound. Uh, the zygomatic arch crosses anteriorly at the level of the tragus. Another point um, is that the masseter muscle lies superficial to the mandible. Um, for the mandibular cortex when doing um, one of these ultrasounds. So the next one is going to, uh, video you're going to see here is, is the ultrasound of the mandible. And so for mandibular ultrasound, you're going to start at the tragus of the ear uh, with the indicator pointed anteriorly. Um, superior to the starting point, the zygomatic arch crosses superficially over the mandibular condyle. The soft tissue superior, I'm sorry, the soft tissue superior is that masseter muscle, and right along here. And um, many times you see it in cross-section on ultrasound at that point. So you're going to slowly scan inferiorly, noting any discontinuity or depression along the cortex of the mandible. And then once we arrive at the angle of the uh, mandible, we'll see the master belly sort of disappear. And then you can rotate the transducer um, 90 degrees so the indicator is pointing towards the ceiling, as we did over here. And then slowly scan towards the patient's chin. And we will also encounter the mental foramen close to the uh, midline seen, that was seen here on this clip. one of those foramens, it looks like there's a step off, but that's just a, the area where the nerve comes through. You're going to scan the, um, the other side as well. Could be identified. Remember the mandible is a ring structure and once a fracture is identified, an accompanying fracture should be uh, sought. So this is actually what a zygoma fracture looks like. You can see the, the discontinuity here, the drop off in the cortex. So the zygoma is going along here and then poof, there's a drop off there. Um, And all that is soft tissue swelling, um, sort of that hypochoic fluid seen just superficial uh, to the fracture. All that material there. And this is a comminuted mandibular fracture it's in different pieces. Um, and the disrupted cortex um, is sort of located at two different uh, places there by those green arrows. And you can see. Uh, sort of accompanying um, superficial uh, layering of the, the fluid there from all that soft tissue swelling that's uh, anterior to this whole process. So many times we see a lot of edema or even hematoma formation above these fracture patterns. So one bone is here, one part of the bone is here of the mandible, and then there's a step off, and then there's another bone here, and then the other bony landmark is over here. So this is common dude broken in two different places. Now what about the sinus? Um, I'm not going to go into this too much, but you can, you can diagnose um, sinusitis actually using uh, ultrasound. And uh, a normal sinus um, appears like this uh, with some sort of uh, rever reverberation uh, artifacts here coming down. And um, we don't make out uh, really any of the uh, posterior lateral 
or medial walls, seeing we just see this sort of anterior spot and then some of this reverberation coming down. Um, but with sinusitis, well now uh, we can actually make out the walls of the sinus and even the posterior area of the sinus down here. And so I know it looks sort of like this one over here when you first look at it, but if you look closely, um, you can actually see how this sort of, sort of like a snowstorm. You don't really see much. Um, again, this is anterior, this is posterior. But over here, now there's fluid in the sinus. Uh, we can see the conduction of the sound all the way down to that posterior and even this lateral wall. And, you know, sort of see another lateral wall over here. So one sinus is here, another one is over here. And uh, you can just sort of make out the anatomy a little bit better because it's filled up with fluid. It's easier to do this when the patient's sitting up. And um, actually, you can even, um, there's some therapeutic effects of low frequency ultrasound on nasal unblocking in patients who have chronic sinusitis. And so, more airflow after the patient gets ultrasound of their sinus. So, I don't know how accurate this is. It was published somewhat recently in 2011. Um, a lot of this stuff requires um, obviously more research, but this is something that I found sort of intriguing um, when I first found out about this, that you can actually use ultrasound not just diagnostically with the sinus, but therapeutically as well. Switching gears, and we're going to talk now Back of the throat as well, and somebody who just has a normal, um, you know, enlarged lymph node reaction to having an infection in their throat. But the problem is, you can also have an abscess cavity start to form uh, adjacent to the tonsil, and um, and this can. You see, see the uvular deviate to one side, uvular deviation. One thing you got to be careful, though, with uh, when you're using endovaginal ultrasound, like, for example, in this 12-year-old male right here, that you don't call it an endovaginal probe. I like to call it the endocavitary probe or something like the oral probe. Maybe that sounds worse. I don't know. But, um, but if you call it an endovaginal probe, they're more likely to um, refuse the procedure. So usually I give them a little medication to, to um, sort of make them feel sleepy, um, like my midazolam. So after a little midaz, um, and you can give that intra-nasally, uh, actually, so it's pretty easy to give. And you want to cover the transducer with a uh, sheath, and uh, just as you would do when you perform endovaginal ultrasound. You put a sheath over the transducer, put some gel. What's not pictured here is gel in between the probe and... ...of the throat, and you will see... Um, sometimes uh, abscesses. And in this case, there's a needle coming right into this abscess. And so you can guide a needle into um, the hypochoic. This is the abscess back here, the hypochoic debris. Now, sometimes what you have instead, though, are um, just pharyngeal lymphadenopathy. And so that's what these are here. These are not abscesses here. It looks kind of like that other abscess a little bit, but these are just enlarged lymph nodes. And we can see um, both lymph nodes here when the transducer's in a in a transverse uh, plane, uh, we can actually uh, make out both of these lymph nodes. Now, when you first look at that, you may wonder, wait, how do you know those are lymph nodes and an abscess? Well, you can actually put on um, some Doppler, and with um, these lymph nodes appear hyperemic in the back of the throat. Um, this is the large vessel down here known as the carotid artery. This is the hyperemic lymph node seen uh, over here. Do not put a needle in that. That's just a normal uh, lymphatic uh, reaction. On the other hand, a peritonsillar abscess um, looks like looks like this. Looks like a very high, very large hypocoke area. This was before uh, drainage, and then we can see basically gone. And so we can monitor the status of the abscess as we go through with ultrasound. This is um, another example here of a peritonsillar abscess. And um, what you can do is you can take uh, calipers and measure the distance from the um, the mucosa in the back of the throat all the way down to where the abscess um, lies. So that's how far you know to, to place a, a needle. So what we do is we measure this distance and we know that, well, the needle only needs to go about a centimeter before it's going to start to get to some pus. 
and it definitely is going to stay away from these large blood vessels back here. And so that's one way we can help guide the procedure. And this is just a, another example here of, um, of a patient who's got a pretty large uh, peritonsillar um, abscess. All this stuff here is pus. It looks like it's sort of solid at first, but as we push on an abscess, pus will will distend, will swirl like that. And um, and that's, um, that, that's what can really sort of give away the abscess as you see that swirling pus come along. Again, we know how far we need to go to get the needle to come in. It's just from the posterior oral pharynx, this um, mucosal line right here, all the way down to where this abscess material is. And um, some of these large abscesses are actually quite easy to drain, although sometimes uh, they're so extensive, they, they involve a, a really large area back here that you may not want to attempt drainage um, yourself in the clinic or even the emergency department setting. You might want to refer some of these more complicated ones to um, a specialist like an otolaryngologist. And, but uh, we went for this one ourselves. This is, you're going to see here, a needle uh, sort of coming in into this uh, abscess. And that's that's has made its way, actually. You can see the distension of the tissue down here, that needle tracking into the abscess. We did inject a little bit of um, lidocaine. That's what you see being injected. And uh, then we start to, um, to drain this out um, using ultrasound guidance until all the pus is gone. This is sort of the order that things happen when somebody comes in and we're worried about something going on with their thyroid. They get a bunch of blood tests, and I'm sure you're learning about all that in your classes, um, which won't go into that. And when one of, these, one of these blood tests come back abnormal, then the first thing that usually happens um, next is they get a thyroid ultrasound, where we can differentiate solid from cystic nodules. We can see um, even solid components of a cystic nodule, whether the thyroid is multinodular. And uh, we can identify um, and differentiate uh, masses in the neck from thyroid nodules or um, lymph nodes, and whether or not lymph nodes are enlarged um, or abnormal. Malignant, some morphology. However, um, really. Um, to be sure, you need to biopsy all of these lesions. And the good news is you can do that fine needle aspiration or biopsy under ultrasound guidance. So other studies that can be done are isotope scans to see how active a nodule might be, and then um, other imaging modalities um, such as CT, MRI, and then um, a chest X-ray to look for any other um, abnormalities that could be associated with um, disease of the thyroid. So. Ultrasound, obviously very inexpensive, it's accessible, it's not invasive, and therefore it's accurate and sort of describing the morphology of the thyroid, um, especially in light of the somewhat inaccuracy of just palpating for the thyroid. Now, um, ultrasound, uh, thyroid ultrasound is definitely um, good at um, detecting unsuspected small nodules, um, and um, therefore a lot of people feel that Ultrasound should be, you know, a good means for um, detecting early thyroid cancer um, because there's an equal rate of thyroid cancer has been shown in palpable and non-palpable thyroid nodules, ones you only see on ultrasound. So that's and the anatomy couldn't be more obvious on ultrasound. I mean, it's like right up next to the uh, edge of the transducer, so we can have a nice high-frequency linear transducer here identifying. This is all the thyroid here. This is the trachea, or as some people call it in the United States, the trachea <laughs> here. And we see the mirror image artifact of the thyroid isthmus. This is the isthmus of the thyroid. We see the mirror image on the other side of the trachea right here. So that's just the mirror image of the Although it is drawn very posterior to the trachea, we actually see it usually just slightly um, on this side of the um, of the trachea, on the left side of the trachea. We'll see the esophagus. That's very easy to see. 
Uh, this is just kind of getting at some of the um, anatomy, some of the longitudinal or sagittal um, anatomy here with some of those thyroid vessels sort of coming out to play. You can make out those thyroid vessels actually quite easy on ultrasound, both the arterial system and some of the venous system as well, as seen over here. And when we come across a nodule, we can put some color flow mapping on it, and you can actually grade these um, nodules. Um, where grade one is no color flow mapping at all seen inside the vessel, inside the nodule. Grade two is where you only see it peripherally. Grade three. Uh, flow at grade four. So this is grade two. It's kind of only in that peripheral area there. And this is uh, an image here of a thyroid um, nodule, mostly a cystic thyroid nodule here. There is this kind of mural component um, seen here with the grayscale. We're not really sure uh, what is going on with this uh, mural component. Um, but when we put some um, color flow on it here, we can see that uh, it really only involves um, here, this flow is coming around only around the, the periphery here. Um, um, but, uh, but there is flow within that mural component outlined uh, here by this uh, arrowhead. We can see there's flow that, that does penetrate into that uh, mural component that telling us that this is actually tissue and not something else like debris. Um, because sometimes it's hard to tell the difference whether something's really um, parenchymal tissue versus something that is just sort of artifact, debris, hematoma, what, ha what have you. And so, um, and this lesion was actually biopsied under ultrasound-guided fine needle aspiration, and it was shown to be benign uh, under cytologic examination. This is what Doppler Category 3, moderately rich um, flow pattern to this nodule here. So normal-looking thyroid here. We see carotid artery over here. And we come across the isthmus. Uh, this is the trachea. We see some um, mirror image artifact of the isthmus here. And then the other part of the thyroid that appears normal is down here. But now there's this nodular component to the right thyroid seen here adjacent to the right carotid. And so when we put Doppler here, this is penetrating color flow with moderately rich uh, vascularity seen there. This is category four, high velocity. peripheral flow as well, uh, but this one um, definitely you'd want to be able to uh, biopsy that one for sure with all that Doppler flow to it. Very suspicious looking. This also demonstrates here the role of um, color Doppler in the thyroid. On the um, this image over here, we the thyroid nodule. So this is normal looking thyroid down here, and this is all this solid looking nodule here. And then uh, we add some color flow Doppler here. The carotid lights up a little bit. And, um, and we can see marked internal vascularity um, increasing the likelihood that this is a malignant nodule. And indeed, after biopsy, this turned out to be a papillary carcinoma. Or at the extremes of age. Um, or changes from visit to visit very rapidly, or the patient describes that to you uh, clinically, or if there's a greater, if it's larger, greater than four centimeters, or if there's any kind of symptoms of like they have a hoarse voice, change in their voice, or difficult to swallow, then um, you really want to be worried that this could be a malignant lesion. Luckily, the malignant lesions are quite uh, rare. Um, they're usually benign. Um, and uh, many times you need to repeat the uh, fine needle aspiration. Um, if you don't get a good enough sample, they come back in um, a few months. Um, or if it looks suspicious, it's about 10% of the time. Um, but in that 10%, um, luckily, most of the time they turn out to be benign. And so right off the bat, about 5%. Now, Graves' disease, um, you're going to learn about it as a second year, but basically it's an autoimmune disease where the thyroid sort of overactive, produces an excessive amount of thyroid hormones from um, the...
secretion and the thyroid starts to really grow rapidly, causing this enlarged, um, diffusely enlarged uh, goiter. And um, it has a really dramatic sort of constellation of neuropsychological and physical signs and symptoms. We see this uh, quite often in both emergency medicine and primary care. And um, it's actually the most common cause of hyperthyroidism in children and adults in adolescence. Um, and usually presents itself during early um, adolescence. There's a hereditary component to it. It's um, between five and 10 times um, more common in females than males. It's also the most common cause of severe hyperthyroidism. And uh, basically, um, about 25 to 30% of the people with Graves' disease will also get Graves' ophthalmopathy, which is a protrusion of one, usually both eyes, caused by um, the inflammation of the eye muscles by these um, autoantibodies. And so you get this marked proptosis. And uh, you, boy, you Google this, you get some pretty, um, pretty interesting uh, pictures that pop up when you do care, just very um, sort of multi-nodular um, enlargement um, of the thyroid, and they have a very prominent, um, usually, um, neck. Uh, you can see the goiter just walking in the room for the patient, and you, you don't really even need to use ultrasound on it, but, but that's what it looks like there. Now, sometimes in these nodules, you'll see some punctate echogen. Um, is there a cancer there or not? And um, it depends on if there's comet tails. So here, in this case, um, there's no comet tails. And so this one is suspicious of a, of a malignancy. And actually, this, this nodule here was confirmed to be papillary carcinoma under fine needle aspiration because we see these punctate echogenicities. So when you see punctate echogenicities, think badness, unless you see a comet tail. And this is what that reverberation artifact, that comet tail, looks like. Um, and so colloid crystals will cause these comet tails. And so with benign nodules, there's a lot of times colloid crystals in there that result in comet tails. And so comet tails in the thyroid, good. Um, here's just a solid thyroid nodule. This turned out to be papillary carcinoma. And this is an example here of a cystic nodule. Um, and uh, under uh, fine needle aspiration, this turned out to be a benign lesion. You can see it's just very simple, very cystic uh, looking. And um, this is just another image here. We were um, we were looking at here of of this um, complex thyroid jugular vein, the carotid artery, and it's uh, almost um, nodularity to it. Some parts are hypoechoic, some parts. Are, um, that's the kind of thing you definitely want to refer for a biopsy. Now, what about the larynx? Um, at the level of the thyroid cartilage. Um, the cartilage, as well as the uh, retinoid cartilages, make sort of an inverted um, a V pattern. We can, we can see that there um, easily on ultrasound. And actually, one study showed that uh, vocal cords were seen 70% of the time on ultrasound in patients undergoing elective intubation. And you can actually make out um, um, the, uh, you know, the tracheal rings seen um, below the level of the thyroid isthmus, which we showed on those earlier images, which itself is just below the level of the uh, cricoid cartilage. And so on ultrasound, we can make out here um, using, this ones are using a curved transducer, although um, they turn it up to the resolution mode, high frequency mode, so you get a little bit more penetration. You can actually see all the way down to the vertebral body here of C6. We can see the thyroid gland here. We can see the esophagus um, just um, off to the um, left side of the uh, trachea seen here. So uh, this is medial, this is lateral, and uh, this would be the uh, left thyroid gland seen here. The isthmus is making its way across. And uh, during intubation, actually we place an endotracheal tube, we can see those prominent uh, 
and off the esophagus quite well. Again, that's that uh, comet tail uh, artifact sign. And this is what um, esophageal intubation looks like. Here's the esophagus down here. Um, not that we're trying to intubate the esophagus. We're, we're, we're shooting for the, the trachea. But as sometimes you miss, and uh, this is an esophageal intubation um, on a difficult to intubate patient, we can see that comet tail now within the, uh, the esophagus. And um, this is um, a wonderful image here by a colleague, Dr. Shibata. Um, thank you very much. And um, it's pretty rare to see that, uh, but when you do, it's an immediate um, indication to pull out that tube and put it over here in the trachea before the patient decompensates. Very briefly now, we're going to talk about ocular ultrasound. And um, the most important thing to keep in mind regarding the anatomy of the eye is, uh, as I think, is that the, the aura serrata is seen here um, anteriorly. This is um, where the, um, the retina is attached right out here at the uh, aura serrata. It's also attached always back here, um, just about always at the level of the optic nerve. So it's always tethered here um, at the aura serrata and then back here at the level of the, um, of the optic nerve. This is the fovea of the eye here. We can see the, um, the optic nerve coming down here with its vasculature. Um, the choroid is the back part of the eye um, back here and the retina is attached um, all the way around at the core right. I keep saying attached because many times the retina becomes detached and the patient has all kinds of symptoms of floaters and everything and they see like they see things in their vision that's floating around. Um, sometimes it feels like a shade is being pulled down. Um, usually it's not um, painful, uh, but if it detaches here, then it may uh, result in permanent blindness. And so when you have it still attached at the fovea, but maybe the retina is starting to detach over here, that's a true ocular emergency, and you need to find an ophthalmologist right away to laser this retina uh, back down when it's um, still attached to that area where the fovea is sometimes called the macula. Anyway, so how we do these ultrasounds of the eye? Well, you're going to use a high-frequency linear transducer, you know, 10, 12, 15 megahertz range, Patient closes their eye, have the patient look straight ahead, use lots of chilled gel. I say chilled gel because it stands up better on itself. And you're going to scan both eyes in both transverse and sagittal when imaging. Scan the globe sagittally, aim the indicator towards the apex of the skull. Fan through the entire globe from lateral to medial and back to lateral. The transducer should then be oriented in a transverse plane with the indicator towards the patient's right eye and fan the sound superior and then inferior and then superior. Initially, the patient should look in a forward direction and the depth adjusted so the eye fills the majority of the screen. So the technique involves both an, a transverse and an axial, um, a transverse which is an axial technique, and also a sagittal or longitudinal uh, technique, as you just saw. Make sure the patient looks straight, and um, have them close their eye and use lots of gel. And then the, the the kinetic exam is performed with the patient's help. In order to visualize the entire ocular contents, the patient can be instructed to gaze to the left, gaze to the right, gaze up, and finally gaze down. And this may repeat be repeated several times until, you know. Um, you have sufficient information to you know render a diagnosis and so I have the patient look all around like that and that seems to really help um, sometimes when you're in the sagittal plane it helps to have the patient gaze medially or I'm sorry gaze nasally while the transducer remains fixed and so you can see the sound going past the lens all the way down to the optic nerve um, the lens can cause sometimes some diffraction of the sound and occludes the optic nerve sheath and so um, we can see the various structures here. Use lots of gel. Lens seen back there. We can actually make out the iris. This is the iris here, the iris here. Okay, so um, in between the iris is the pupil. And so what happens is when you shine light in the other eye, the eye that's open, you can actually see this iris um, constrict and, um, and you, um, the pupil will constrict uh, because um, this structure here and this structure here will move towards one another. Um, and then you want to look in the posterior segment, sometimes called the vitreous uh, hemorrhage, uh, uh, vitreous um, body, 
um, or posterior segment of the eye, vitreous humor, and then behind that is the retina attached down at the choroid. And as well, and we can see all kinds of cool stuff. We can see lens dislocations. That's what that's going on here. This is not over here, but dislocated. Um, we can see intraocular foreign bodies. This is a metallic foreign body. A guy was working with metal and something. Um, in two different planes, uh, causes some shadowing underneath it. Um, and we can see uh, papal edema also. We know how difficult that can be with the physical exam. Um, and uh, there's that subarachnoid space that's around the optic nerve. It's not supposed to have any uh, cerebral spinal fluid in it, um, but uh, when you have high intracranial pressure uh, that compresses the optic nerve, um, then um, you can, that whole Elevated intracranial pressure, maybe from a head trauma, maybe from a tumor or other processes, um, we used, we can look with the ophthalmoscope for papal edema, uh, or we can see the optic nerve sheath widen out using ultrasound. And um, that's the, um, this is sort of a diagram showing the retinal artery. The yellow stuff here is the optic nerve, and you can see the various layers of the um, optic um, of the uh, optic nerve sheath, and when fluid uh, gets in there, cerebral spinal fluid sort of slowly percolates in there when you have intracran elevated intracranial pressure through that trabeculated um, arachnoid space. There's little trabeculations in here. I don't know if you can see that drawn there or not. Um, well, that causes that whole sheath to widen out. And as that uh, happens, you can actually measure that in ultrasound quite easily. So this is the choroid of the eye back here. We're going to measure three millimeters posterior to the choroid, at that level we can measure the width of the optic nerve sheath diameter. This one happens to be widened. So how, how wide is normal? You can have up to 6 millimeters in adults and up to 4.5 millimeters in children before it's said to be a widened optic nerve sheath diameter. Here we are measuring just sort of how you do it. You sort of measure from the choroid of the eye, the back of the eye, 3 millimeters, you wait until that number reaches 3, and then you bring up another caliber, and at that level you measure the width of that of that sheet, that shadow that comes down. Um, and when you have a retinal detachment, um, what happens is um, this can sometimes be difficult uh, to diagnose under direct ophthalmoscopy. Unless you have the patient uh, really have a dilated eye and you have a really cooperative patient, there's not a lot of uh, there's no trauma, there's no swelling of the eyelids. Um, in any of those situations, it's, it's, it, it seems to be easier, at least um, uh, for me, to have the patient just close their eye, eye altogether and put gel on it and then look with ultrasound. You can see the, the, um, the retina is detached off the back of the core of the eye. Um, it always gets, it's, it's, the retina is always attached to two locations, though, the optic nerve and the aura serrata. Um, and so we can see the anterior chamber there and the lens. And this is one of our machines does 3D. We can see the retina sort of peeling off the back of the eye in this particular view here on 3D ultrasound. It gives you the sense that it's not just a, a linear uh, thing that we think about on 2D. It's really this whole three-dimensional, um, you know, envelope that peels off the back of the eye um, like an onion skin here seen on three-dimensional ultrasound. Now, um, this is an example here of retinal detachment. We can see it's tethered at this location, and it's this sort of tethered membrane that um, is coming off the back of the, the choroid there as the patient looks around. And uh, as I mentioned, it depends where the retina gets detached. It could be uh, at the level of the, the macula, um, and uh, the macula is just lateral to the optic nerve sheath. So here's the optic nerve sheath coming down here, and if the retina is detached, it's off the back of the eye at the level of the macula, um, then um, it, they, have, they have sort of less of a good prognosis when this gets lasered back down. Ophthalmologist comes along and uses lasers to get this uh, um, retina to be attached back in the back of the core of the eye there. So that's a MAC off retinal detachment because you see it's really only tethered right at the optic nerve sheath. And, um, and there's another example. This is the same patient. We're just fanning through it now. So as we fan through this eye, we can see that optic nerve sheath and just lateral to it, um, it's, it's um, not attached. And so that's a MAC off.
um, sort of funnel looking detachment. This is a Mac on rental attachment. So again, this is lateral. This is the optic nerve sheath. This is where the macula is here and the, the retina is still attached to that location then it abruptly comes off. And these are the ones here that you really want to get lasered down as soon as possible before this part peels off as well. And unfortunately these Here is the retina, okay, yellow being the retina there. The retina is still attached, but the vitreous body can peel away from the back of the eye. And when it does that, it, it definitely peels away. Um, it usually peels away off of the off the optic nerve sheath. So that's kind of how I differentiate because they look very similar. The attached vitreous body and a retinal attachment look similar. It depends if it involves the optic nerve sheath or not. So if it doesn't, if it involve, if it if it peels off the back of the optic nerve sheath, then it's likely uh, a detached vitreous body rather than a, a retinal detachment. And as the patient looks left and looks right during the kinetic exam, you can see that it looks like clothes in a dryer. Um, that's what a detached vitreous body looks like, especially if you overgain the image a little bit. As the patient looks around, it kind of looks like clothes to detach vitreous body from the tethered membrane appearance of a retinal detachment. All right, well, we threw a lot of pathology in this time. Uh, I tried not to do that, but I also light at the end of the tunnel, pun intended, and um, when you get to the, um, uh, the uh, hands-on component, uh, we're going to take a look at that uh, carotid uh, vasculature, the thyroid, um, maybe even do an ocular exam, um, and um, you know, come along those, um, the bony landmarks on the face, and also um, look into the brain at the um, middle cerebral artery. All right, thank you very much.